Uh, meantime, stocks closing off their worst levels of the day. The Dow managing to finish with gains after falling as much as 515 points at its lows. But the tech-heavy Nasdaq tumbling more than 2 percent. The benchmark 10-year yield falling to its lowest level in over a month. Let's get more with Julian Emanuel, uh, who leads strategy for Evercore ISI. Julian, great to have you with us. You know, I was reading through the notes, and it sounded pretty gloomy. And then I get to your target, which is 4,800 on the S&P 500, and I, I couldn't figure out what kind of path you saw to 4,800 if things near term at least look so dire. So basically, look, we have to acknowledge that, you know, Friday you hit the bear market level, down 20. And the question now becomes whether this is a non-recession bear market, uh, and we do see a growth slowdown, but not a recession, importantly, or a recessionary bear market. The difference really means everything. Um, and from where we stand, the path to higher prices really is a function of being able to discount the macro news and focus on the fact that you're still going to have mid to high single digit earnings growth and that what you've really had is a valuation compression aided and abetted and really catalyzed uh, by a rise in bond yields, which by all rights is either cooling or has ended. May I, may I interrupt you, Julian? Um, it, something just didn't strike me the right way when you said let's ignore the macro environment and believe that earnings will be this percent. I mean, doesn't one depend on the other? Doesn't earnings depend on the macro environment? Isn't that what we saw with Walmart? Uh, no. Isn't that what we well, saw with not, SNAP? So, so to, and, and there's no question about that, but when you look at some of the, the components that really point out stresses in the system, they are not there. Credit is a very important one. We've gotten, you know, if you look at the credit markets, they have been a harbinger of recession time and again over the last 20 years. And you got commentary yesterday from the head of the world's uh, most important bank saying the credit markets were healthy. Uh, the consumer obviously is stressed. There's definitely pockets. We're seeing it today in some of these reports that the stress is not necessarily as pervasive as perhaps we thought. And again, you know, to be clear, looking for 1.4% GDP growth in 2022 is very different than looking for a recession. And in terms of the market, really is an extremely material difference. Julian, 4,800, obviously a big jump from where we are now. And I think you would submit, maybe we have a little more on the downside, but I'll ask you this, what sectors are going to get us there? Because Obviously, in doing your work, you have to target certain areas that are going to provide the strength. Right. So, so the first thing, and when thinking about the last month, what we overlooked was the public's desire to sell stocks. Uh, our view was it was likely a tax-driven event, but frankly, the, the last month has been much more uh, of the public selling because essentially uh, growth stocks are where the public is overexposed. In our view... This is likely to be, and you saw it on a day like today as some of the indices recovered, a value-led market. Financials, industrials, particularly healthcare, very defensive, um, you know, really insensitive to both yields moving around and geopolitics. But we do think that the shift from growth to value is something that's ongoing. But there again, the bull case rests on essentially a drying up of the public selling of these stocks, which we do think when they figure out or, you know, the, the circumstances uh, show themselves that the employment situation remains strong and that inflation, in our view, is peaking perhaps later this summer. We think actually the, the physical peak uh, did occur. But when things turn down, uh, that will be a, a more benign environment for the equity markets. Julian, always great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Julian Emanuel, Evercore ISI. Um, you saw his favorite sectors. Healthcare is number one. He would recommend deploying cash into healthcare. Neutral, though, on energy. Tim, do you like these sector allocations? How, how can you not? I, I do think that healthcare will continue. Also, you know, the political uh, theater around the healthcare and the pharma sectors at times has been much more intense. And maybe that's something we should be worried about as we get into uh, elections. But I, I think uh, energy. I'm going to keep saying it. It, it. The weighting in the S&P was 16 percent. 
at the peak in 2008. Uh, we've already seen it effectively double since the end of the year. Uh, I just want to say one thing about credit, too, because I, I think we're smart to be bringing it up. Maybe we're being a little bit overly doomsday on this. But I, when I look at the Bank of America OAS high yield spreads, the mm -hmm. spread of what you're willing to pay over commensurate treasuries and high yield, we're at 5 percent right now. We were at 3 percent uh, a little while ago. What was the last period we had in markets outside of the pandemic that we all thought was a very stressful credit time? It was the fourth quarter of 2018, uh, and it, they got to a high of 530. We're almost right there. And at that time, we were acknowledging we have credit issues. I think you have to pay attention. And this is happening just in a span of a few weeks, yeah. right? I mean, that jump. Uh, Bono, and what do, you make, what do you make of Julian's 4,800 call? Uh, I have a hard time getting behind it. I, I can understand the logic there. So diplomatic, I, I, Bono, and I feel like you want, really wanted to say something else. But uh, well, let's not mouth. put words in my mouth. You know, <laughs> I think there's, you know, we're going to... Uh, Take the, take the high road here. I think um, I can follow his logic in terms of getting there, and, and his sector allocation makes a lot of sense to me, but I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around how, if we're going to see compression in growth, and that's where you t tend to see the earnings growth, how are we going to make that up in terms of lower beta, lower growth subsectors? That's where I think, you know, I have a hard time reconciling the price target. Um, 4,800, I, I think, is a bit high. I do expect to see continued outperformance in both healthcare and energy, though. Yeah, so I guess the real question is, like, and again, you guys are talking about buying things for trades. Guy just mentioned something like that. There's going to be some great trading opportunities. There already have been a lot of great trading opportunities. Oh, yeah. We also recognize the fact that a lot of our viewers, a lot of retail investors should not be shorting stocks. It's just not a great sort of thing. We talk about the options. You get a great show Friday, 530s. There's opportunities to <laughs> find your risk and make short bets or hedge against long positions or do that sort of thing. So I guess the point is, is like, when do you want to buy for those bounces? We've had two 10 percent bounces or so yeah. this year off of lows. Julian's going to be right that we're going to have a very violent rally at some point. It could come from lower. It could end up at 4,600. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like throwing stuff up against the wall to see what that actual number is. But to these guys' point, the valuation, we've had the price come down. We haven't had the E come down yet. And when the E comes down, that's when you're to start thinking about what's the proper valuation, right, for this market? What's the proper multiple you're willing to pay? And I think the next rally that we top out in before we have 2022 estimates really come down to, let's say, mid to low single digits year-over-year growth, um, I don't think it's going to be 4,800 where we bounce to.